Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe Devader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from, without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? Up first is 2020's Calico, a super laid-back and fuzzy game about rebuilding a cat cafe in a town full of magical girls and magical stuff. Following that is the cinematic interactive exploration of three androids and their journeys to break from their programming and make choices on how to live for themselves in the Motor City. 2018's Detroit Become Human. We've had several episodes before that just seem like the most extreme matchup of games. This is up there. It's definitely up there. I don't think either of these games have basically literally anything in common in terms of, like, the content of the games at all. So you know what we're doing? They both released on Steam in the year that was 2020. You know what? Bite me. That's And, and not the cats. Not the cats in the cat cafe. You, you can stay back. But that's honestly the best we can do. I mean, there's other animals that could bite you. There's bears. That's even more terrifying. Eh, they're bears. They're fine. Are they cute cub bears? No. Well, there are cute cub bears, but there are also bears. <laughs> Scary. Anyway, Joe, how are you doing? What are you playing? Uh, I finished Nirvana Initiative. Yay! It's very good. I think overall I like it more than the first game, but I think the big twist is so confusing the way it is framed and the way it is actually, like, enacted that I genuinely, even now, could not tell you how the pieces fit together definitively. That being said, uh, the ending is about ten times goofier than the first one, and I like that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I definitely recommend it. You, uh, I know that you are currently playing the first game, which I assume we're going to talk about in a second. But, uh, for anybody wondering, if you want to just skip to Nirvana Initiative, you can do that. I don't you shouldn't. You should play both. But uh, it is both cases in both games are 100% separated from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. So there's that. Uh, and then I continued a little bit of Haunting Ground and I'm no longer playing Haunting Ground. That game sucks. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, I have got to the third pursuer, which is a guy with a gun. And that gun is an instant kill. And I'm done. Hmm. Yeah, that does not sound that fun. Uh, but yeah, and that sure sounds like an Ushikoshi game for Nirvana Initiative. With uh, <laughs> It just takes too much to explain the plot. And even then, was it really worth it? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. But hey, I'm glad you had a good time with it. Uh, you're right. I did start I, The Somnium Files, the first game in that series. And I'm about an hour to an hour and a half into it so far. Uh, gone with a set to the carousel at Bloom Park. And we are driving away from that. So I'm kind of in the middle of the investigation. I think it's day two. It's still early days early going. But uh, having a good time discovering how much of a creep Date is. <laughs> he's, such, he's such a loser creep. Especially with the um, the receptionist at Lemniscate. <laughs> yeah. She, so she is a running joke in both games because she shows up in both games. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's a lot. I also have a way too early prediction for the case six years ago. But we'll just leave that in the back of my mind or we'll take it offline because I don't want to spoil anything too early. I have one character that I don't know if you've met him yet, but I'm going to say his name and I want you to tell me what you think of him. Because uh, there is a correct answer. Ota. A dweeb. Yeah, he's a huge, he's a huge goddamn dweeb. Yeah, 100%. You do that white knight stuff, get out of here with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I have met him and we've uh, we've moved on with the, the blackmail video of 
glomping onto the public officials. So we're, we're at that point right now. Yeah, uh, Ira sure is a thing. <laughs> she, she, you know what? She knows how to get with I'll give her that. That's right. But it should be fun to continue. In the meantime, let's talk about some composer follow-up news. I like to cover different game news stories out there. Follow up on what the composers we've covered on the show, what they're working on, how it ties into game news headlines. Let's start with your monthly Game Pass rollout, or at least for the, the first half of July. Yakuza 0, Yakuza Kiwami, and Yakuza Kiwami 2 are returning to the service. They went away for a while. They're coming back. They're available now. So uh, great work, of course, by Hidenori Shoji there. That basically means that everything except for 6 is now on Game Pass. The whole series. That's amazing. So go check that out. We talked about Road 96 as an honorable mention, I believe. Mm Mm-hmm last year on our best of 2021 and so that is a game that is out now on game pass one of your favorites is not tied to a composer but power wash simulator is coming to the service oh you mean what will probably end up being one of my game like my top three games of the year (laughs) (laughs) not even joking so you can play that on july 14th unfortunately games that are leaving the service on july 15th include carrion Chris Tales, and Lethal League Blaze, uh, one of those we've covered on the show before, but a couple honorable mentions on past best ofs. If you find yourself with like four hours before it goes off, Carrion is pretty good, and I do recommend it. Chris Tales, you will not be able to finish uh, if you're listening to this and, and you're going to go start it right after listening to this episode. Uh, no, you don't have time. But Carrion, you definitely have time. Following that, though, uh, Psychonauts 2 was one of the bigger releases of last year, one of those higher sort of Game of the Year contenders for a lot of people that played it. The Motherlobe edition has been announced. It is a physical edition that is coming on September 17th, and it is also coming to PlayStation 4. That music, of course, done by Peter McConnell. We talked about him for his work on Sly 2 Band of Thieves. Uh, and also, he was mentioned a lot during Grim Fandango, because he did the music for that game as well. As well as the Tomorrow Children Phoenix Edition, launches on September 6th on PS4 and PS5. That, of course, uh, has music composed by Joel Korolitz, who has been a name we have said so many times in the past couple years, uh, and for good reason. So, yeah. There you go. More releases with more music from people we talked about. Definitely a bigger name, Joel Korolitz, these days than when he made the soundtrack to the Tomorrow Children way back when. But yeah, he's like really excited about it. They re-recorded a whole bunch of stuff. Should be interesting to see. A big, you know, PlayStation indie news push. They also talked about uh, Sea of Stars. Just gave up a new you know, trailer for that and confirming it's coming to PlayStation platforms. But that'll be next year. So good stuff there. He's bigger than he was when he did this soundtrack. He's bigger than he was when we talked about him for Unfinished Swan. (laughs) Honestly. It's it's definitely a a good time to be Joel Corlitz and getting some good music jobs there. In an odd story, there was a news blurb that flashed across that in television, Amico had its trademark lapsed as abandoned. And now it's back live. So... Uh, who knows what's going on with the company that Tommy Tallarico owns? Uh, it's just kind of comical at this point, but it was a weird news story. Didn't he get ousted recently? Oh, did he? Oh, maybe I that's news so. to me. I think he got removed. <laughs> oh my god, what a mess! That is <laughs> such a mess. I feel like that was supposed to come out like two years ago, and like the pandemic just ruined everything along with uh, questionable leadership. It's supposed to be what, like a game console that had like bite-sized family games on it or something like that? Uh, Earthworm Jim? Okay, I don't think he has actually been... Rem- I, I could have sworn I heard something about how he had been taken off the company's leadership or something, but I, I guess I'm making that up in my mind because I'm not finding evidence of that. So, but yeah, still, even without that, what a mess. <laughs> it, it really, really is. And then let's get to VGM Hurdle for this week. Of course, it's the... 
uh, take on the hurdle wordle phenomenon where every day over at vgm-hurdle.glitch.me there is a video game music track for you to guess and test your knowledge and can you get it in one seconds two seconds four all the way up to increments leading up to 16 seconds broke the one second streak last week on the show Going to keep our fingers crossed. There have been some good inclusions, though, this past week. Uh, Trial from Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. Loved that. Mm-hmm. Mass Destruction from Persona 3. Yep, that was uh, that was a fast one. Uh, there was one other that was just like, uh, the opening theme of Super Mario World <laughs> was one of them. Oh, yeah, and uh, Gusty Garden Galaxy from Mario Galaxy. Like it's It's been a good time. We haven't had some weird ones, but... Knock on all the wood, cross all the fingers. Joe, are you ready for this week's VGM hurdle? Yeah, it's time for a weird one. All right, here we go. Let's listen to this first second. Oh, ducks. <laughs> ducks in outer space. And we've talked about that pretty recently with uh, the moon from DuckTales. It sure is. All right, there's another easy one. That does qualify as an easy contender here. Felt <laughs> sorry for us after last week's Battle Block Theater. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Also, isn't that just weird, like, that? how you can quickly... Just even one second. I, I think you know, people would be like, you're crazy, but it's also clearly, undeniably, these tracks. Mm-hmm. I, I know, like, a couple months ago, uh, it was God of the Dead. And just oh um, yeah, that one chord at the very start was like oh yeah, I know which one that is. <laughs> that little guitar strum to open, uh, you know, the title screen from Hades. Yep. <laughs> like sometimes that's just all you need. All right, let's talk about video games and tangentially the music in those video games. Hi, that's what this podcast is. You've been listening for fifteen minutes. We're going to talk about Calico. Now, Calico is another one of those games that I'm bringing to the table that uh you've probably never heard of, and I'm not going to fault you for that. It's another one of those uh, smaller indie things that I just bring every once in a while so that everybody can be super confused about what I'm talking about. We tried to give you the heads up about a month or two ago, though. It was a free game on Twitch if you're a Prime Gaming member, so... If you're a regular listener, you're at least generally aware we've talked about Calico a little bit before. It's also part of a couple of itch.io bundles right now, doing fundraising for some of the Roe vs. Wade stuff currently. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can, if those bundles are still up, you can go find those. And yeah, it, it goes on sale pretty frequently, I think. So, it was originally released on December 15th, 2020 for PC, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox One. It was developed by Peachy Keen Games and published by Whitethorn Games. Uh, According to the description on Steam, quote, Calico is a day-in-the-life community sim game where you are given an important and adorable task. Rebuild the town's cat cafe and fill it with cute and cuddly creatures. Build up your cafe by filling it with cute furniture, fun decorations, yummy pastries, and get it bustling with animals again. And that's essentially the gist of it. That's the game. Uh, you create a character, and then you are revitalizing the town's cat cafe. You can also explore the town around you. There are other magical folks that live around there. Uh, there are other animals, too. Not just cats. There are dogs... Red pandas, bears, wolves, and a bunch of other stuff. All of this is sort of dressed up in a pastel aesthetic that is really inspired by anime Magical Girl style. Uh, There's also things like you can make potions where you can make an animal really big. So you can make a big cat and then you can ride it. Or you can make the cat an orb and now that cat must roll to live. Which seems cruel to me, but the cat seems fine with it, so who am I to judge? Uh, and that's essentially it. Uh, there are mini games like there's a cooking mini game where you become really small and you have to pick up the ingredients and throw them into the mixing bowl. Yeah, it's it's that kind of game. So this <laughs> is where I will ask, uh, hey, what are our experiences with Calico? Well, when we mentioned that it was part of that 
uh, Prime Gaming, you know, claim your free game sort of thing. I did so. Haven't downloaded it. Haven't played it. But definitely appeared on my radar. I think we were planning to pair this game with Shenmue. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Which would have fit a little bit better, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I guess a little bit better, but still not a whole lot more. Uh, but yeah, we've had this one in the books for a little while. Yeah, I had to push it back a couple of times, but here we are talking about it again. As for my experience, this is going to sound really weird considering I'm bringing it to the show. I didn't like it. This game has an audience, and the people that like this game really like this game. I don't know what else. I didn't really like it. I think the soundtrack is really, really good, which is the main reason why I'm I'm bringing it to the show, but... I I didn't have anything to latch on to personally, so there's that. Uh, But I did get to meet the developer at PAX, and I knew about the developer before that because uh, they used to do stuff at Desert Bus a lot. Uh, And then at PAX, I gave the game a shot and I was able to talk to the head developer. Their name is Kells. And... All of the information I can find came from various interviews with them. This game doesn't have a Wikipedia article or anything like that. It's one of those. So, you know, information is not exactly plentiful, if you know what I mean. So, when asked what kind of game were they looking to make with Calico, the answer was, quote, it's basically a huge wish fulfillment game. It's basically everything I want in the world put into a game. Uh, at cons, people would compare the game's watercolorish art style to Okami. And Kel says she didn't really intend for that comparison. Uh, but she does admit that she was very likely influenced by it. Quote, Okami is my favorite game, and the game kind of turned out Okami-esque. I wanted it to be very soft, make you happy, and be cuddly and cozy. So the art style, I I can see the comparison to Okami 100%. It's a little bit less woodblock, but that watercolor sort of aesthetic is definitely there. It didn't review great. Its Metacritic score is 57 Most reviewers agreed that while the aesthetics and the general vibe of the game were pretty well done, the gameplay is kind of repetitive. It had a huge amount of bugs when it came out. But uh, the game is rated very positive on Steam, for what it is worth. Uh, Many user reviews show the game absolutely has an audience. That audience really, really, really likes it. So if it sounds like a game that you think you would enjoy, maybe you should look into Calico. I don't know. Honestly, if it has its fan base, that's all you really need. Mm Mm-hmm, I agree. So, in terms of composer, we're going to talk about somebody by the name of Slide20XX. Obviously, that's not their real name. Uh, That is their their pseudonym. Their real name is John Hamilton Smith V. And according to, I believe, information off of their website, uh, decided to write music for games at age 13, which is, I think, around the time I decided I wanted to make games. So I can relate to that pretty hard, I think. As he puts it, Slide20XX, his pseudonym, is, quote, an extremely obscure reference to Sonic the Hedgehog. Though what this reference is, he does not explain, and I don't know what it is, and I think that's the point. (laughs) Yeah, Um, I I wouldn't have pegged it as Sonic, but uh, (laughs) he'll he'll keep that secret to himself, I guess. He performed at MIT's Hacking Arts Festival and in Madrid, Spain, as part of the Red Bull Music Academy. He's a fan of anime, slam poetry, and, quote, explorations in the role of art and media in culture and society. You can follow him on Twitter at Slide20XX. In terms of his discography, obviously Calico is on there, but he has also scored multiple Steven Universe PSAs, uh, mostly anti-racism ones. He also composed for games called Nova Island and Rec Room. Hey, Rec Room! 
I'm not familiar with that game. I'm surprised you are. <laughs> it's a VR title uh, where you can do different things in a recreation room. So, uh, yeah, it's one of the kind of notable uh, pretty early days VR in the times of like HTC Vive and early Oculus. Uh, but they that's hmm. pretty neat. Interesting. So in terms of development research for Calico Centric itself, it actually features vocals by Emily Anderson, but there is also one track that features vocals by the one and only Amy Evans, <laughs> whom we have brought up many, many, many times on this show. Uh, she is super talented, and we like to talk about Miss Evans. He also refers to Ivy and Sarashu, who we talked about for their work on Ekenfell in episode 112, as inspiration for the work on Calico, specifically their work on Steven Universe. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you can actually go buy this soundtrack on Bandcamp at slide20xx.bandcamp.com. So if you like what you hear, even if the game doesn't sound like your bag, uh, the music is pretty good, honestly. I really kind of like what I've heard of the soundtrack. I mean, I've heard the whole thing, but you know what I mean. And let's get to sharing that with the people with our five critical tracks. The first of which is critical track number one, Cats and Magical Girls. This is one of those games where, like, I can't exactly tell you where these songs play because this isn't the kind of game where I can just go look up a Let's Play. It's, you know, an open world life sim. It doesn't work that way. But this song, I at least know, plays on the title screen. And uh, this song, I think, is a pretty good opener to the whole thing because it's honestly just about the tone that I expect from Calico's art alone. Like, there's the light piano notes, and then there's this cheerful, almost colorful vibe to the whole song, and it's got a really, really catchy sort of melody to go along with it. Uh, I think this song is a great example of why this soundtrack is quite good. Yeah, I think when you talk about you know, the pastel sort of art style, you look at the cover of the soundtrack on the video version. I feel like this song does kind of capture this sort of feeling perfectly. Uh, you're right. Catchy, positive, energetic, uh, and just nice to hear like the instruments that you start to hear. I play like, yeah, it's piano, but uh, we're definitely rooted in synths here. Uh, and so some good synth instruments, you definitely will hear different varieties of like electric piano and uh, some of the bass, the lower synths that you get. Uh, it's, it's nice. It's a good, positive, uplifting piece to start things off. Yeah. But following that is Critical Track number two, and this is actually my favorite song of the Critical Five. This is A Cat is a Cat. Every day is something new When my day begins with you This is one of the songs with vocals by Emily Anderson. I want to say that this song was used in marketing. I've heard it before, and I feel like, yeah, that's probably why it was like you know, some Nintendo. No, was it Nintendo Direct? Yeah, I, I think it showed up at a Nintendo Direct. I'm not 100% on that, but I feel like it did. Or like some wholesome games thing or something like that. It does sound familiar to me, so I think you're right. It's, it's definitely a big prominent piece there. Yeah, so when I was going through the soundtrack, this was one where it's like, oh, I've heard this one before for sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's really, really catchy. 
Uh, and again, it just has this sort of happy vibe to it. And Emily Anderson is a very, very good vocalist. Uh, she's killing it. So yeah, this is a, I think this is my favorite song of the Critical Five for sure. I agree. It's a good one. It has that feeling of like, again, lack of experience, not knowing where it plays, but it'd be a really good piece of just like, yep, another day. Like, let's let's see what we can accomplish here at the Cat Cafe. It's got this like jazzy lounge singer vibe to it, which I like, mm-hmm. but a very, you know, soft padded undertone with the keyboards here. It kind of feels like you can almost hear the smile on Emily Anderson's face when she's singing, which I really, mm-hmm. really like. I love when when vocalists can bring that across with just sound. It's it's fun. Oh, yeah. It makes a huge difference. And you totally get that. Following that, we have critical track number three. This is Ocean's Breath. What's that? Joe went with one of the sort of more atmospheric piano pieces? How out of character for him. Uh, (laughs) I just really like this song because it's very low-key, even for this game. And it it feels relaxing. I'm going to assume this plays on, like, a beach. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, this feels very fitting to be, like, a sort of quiet beach... I kind of picture it being in the morning or something like that, uh, being alone with your thoughts. And it's it's just a very pretty song, I think. Yeah, you could totally imagine it going with, like, sound effects of waves or gulls coming in and just kind of chirp, chirping away. Uh, yeah, it's nice. It's simple. It's kind of like a deconstruction of, like, different chords and, like, hanging on for a long time with like that pedal on a, a keyboard or piano but you're right it does have that salty breath fresh kind of vibe <laughs> That's, that is sure a way to put it <laughs> following that is critical track number four which is the best title on it in general the most fun to say this is city cat kitty cat This song reminds me of another game. Ace Attorney. Yeah, I think that might be right. I think you might be right on that. This is very Ace Attorney. It also, in certain ways, feels like some walking around town music in like a Persona 4 type game. Mm -hmm, Something mm -hmm. in there. I just dig this song because it's really catchy and it's got that sort of jazzy vibe to it that i i really dig it's a fun song to listen to uh and uh i like it i don't know where it plays but i like it yeah i just get that happy office vibe from ace attorney um though you're leaning more here into the electric piano as we talked about you know kind of comparing the different senses that they're going with um but this one totally fits and again yeah i wish i maybe like you're out on the town you're out on the city streets to go do something to acquire supplies? I don't know. I'm spitballing here, but that's an amazing title, and it's a fun bopping piece. <laughs> and lastly, critical track number five. This is Beneath the Surface.
This song features vocals by both Emily Anderson and Emmy Evans. Uh, this is the credits theme, as far as I'm aware, as far as I can tell. And it's just the complete opposite of A Cat is a Cat. Uh, in terms of tone, it's just sort of this almost calming wave over you, and these two vocalists are really, really good in this duet together. It's it's honestly... I'd put this at third favorite for me, but it's definitely up there. You want a vocalist for your dreamy, ethereal credits piece? Yeah, you go with Amy Evans and you don't look back. <laughs> like, it's, it's that simple. So... Uh, wow, I just it's exactly her vocal quality that you'd expect, and it works so well here like it does with many other games. I want to say this song was announced to have Emmy Evans in it around the same time that Lena Rain announced, like, yeah, uh, she's doing the credits song for Chicory. Like, I think that was within the same week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's that. Four tracks on the cutting room floor. We got two here. This first one is Staying In With You. Based on the title and the general vibe of the song, I'm going to assume this is like hanging out in the cafe, which is also your house as far as I'm aware. And this does definitely have that sort of relaxed, lounging about at home feel to it. It's got that uh, melody from A Cat is a Cat, which is good. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a very, very nice calm piece yeah it's like a subdued version of that one so maybe like the underscore of it a little bit good to hear it kind of toned down here ah uh, makes me almost wonder again it's just speculating I, I i don't know but i think that'd be like a perfect compliment for like maybe a night version like it's at night in the cafe um you know just you get like the energy of the day with the vocals but this is good like you know just winding things down and the second track in the cutting room floor, this is Kodama's Nocturne. Honestly, if there was any song that was very close to being in the Critical Five, it's this one. My guess is that this plays in a forest. The word Kodama kind of mm. makes me think that. Uh, Kodama are the little... If you've seen Princess Mononoke, they're the little bobblehead things that live in the forests. Yeah, little forest spirits. They're a type of yokai, I think. That's where I'm going to assume this plays. Uh, it's just a really, really cool piece that that really brings across like a vibe of nature to me honestly i don't know what else to say about it except that i really like it it is a different energy you're right like some different instruments here at work but it's a good thing i don't think it's my favorite compared to the others but i appreciate its flexibility and versatility so what will i never forget about calico again it didn't mesh with me and that's fine, but this soundtrack is genuinely really, really good. Uh, I really dig it. If you like what you've heard, you should definitely think about going and buying it on Bandcamp. Uh, I personally try to, if I can, buy soundtracks on Bandcamp when we talk about them. I don't always succeed in being able to do that because I don't have a lot of money. But it's it does help the artist a lot. Uh, and I'm honestly really looking forward to seeing what uh, Slide 20XX does from here, because this soundtrack is, I think, genuinely impressive. 
uh, especially for the type of game that Calico is in general. Yeah, they've got a really good sense for like rhythm and melody and just kind of getting a catchy little earworm in your head and then complementing it with good synth piano instruments. I really appreciate the pleasantness of the soundtrack, though I don't think I'm going to get to that game anytime soon. Doesn't sound like my bag, but uh, yeah, really like the music. Also pretty good lyricist. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Both the vocal tracks on this soundtrack that we, we covered have, have pretty fun lyrics in general. So, hey, shoutouts for that. As for our transition, uh, I'm not super surprised that I could not find a fan remix or a fan cover of the music of this game. Again, this is a pretty obscure game. It's not exactly one you're going to, you know, search YouTube for and find a thousand results in terms of music. Which is a shame, because again, soundtrack's really good. So we're just going to go ahead and do what we usually do in that situation, and I'm going to throw in another song from the soundtrack. This song is called Midnight Pause. I'm going to assume it plays at, like, night or something. I assume. And please enjoy that. We will be right back. That was nice to learn about a pleasant game, all pastel colors, running a cat cafe. Now let's jump to the future in a modernized city that is also really dystopic with a lot of blues and metals and all sorts of harsh colors with big AAA budgets. It's time to talk about Detroit Become Human. Detroit Become Human Released for PlayStation 4 on May 25th, 2018. The PC version first launched on the Epic Games Store on December 12th, 2019. And it took until June 2020 for it to come to Steam. There is that loose, flimsy connection between the two games. 2020 on Steam. All right. You can either buy it standalone or in a package with other games that its developer has made, including Heavy Rain, which we talked about on episode 25 of the show, and Beyond Two Souls, which we talked about on episode 108. Because Detroit Become Human is developed by Quantic Dream and published by Sony Interactive Entertainment on PlayStation 4, but Quantic Dream got to self-publish it on PC. Like Quantic Dream's other games, this is an interactive third-person drama and action-adventure game, requiring the player to move and guide a playable character into interactions with objects and other non-player characters in a scene to progress the story. There will be quick-time events that happen, as well as dialogue decisions that will branch out the story into a wide variety of outcomes, which are viewable in a flowchart at the end of each chapter. Now, players can also jump to points in the flowchart to explore different outcomes and kind of flesh it all out if you so choose and just want to see all the different options. What makes this game different from other Quantic Dream adventures, though, is the use of three main protagonists. They can die at any point in the story, and the game will continue without them. If you're like me, one of them will die way earlier than they're meant to, (laughs) and you just have to suffer with the consequences. Or change it, but if you're like me, suffer with the consequences. It all makes for a game that has at least, like, 85 endings based on the flowchart, but it's littered with endless variations for how you get there. What is the story of Detroit Become Human? Well, as you can guess, we're in Detroit during the year 2038, where the city has been revitalized by the invention and introduction of androids into everyday life by the CyberLife Corporation. 
But when the androids start behaving as if they're alive, which is a process known as deviancy, their free will starts to spiral the events of the story out of control. And here we follow our three protagonists. We start with police investigator android Connor. He is sent by Cyberlife to assist Lieutenant Hank Anderson, an alcoholic detective who hates androids. In the course of their investigation into an outbreak of deviance, they either bond or fall apart, as they can discover the home base of the deviant rebels, as well as the inner workings of Cyberlife itself. There's Kara, who is a housekeeper android for Todd Williams and his daughter Alice. And Kara becomes a deviant to escape with Alice after Todd attacks them in a domestic violence incident. The two travel across Detroit without a home, and they intend to enter Canada, which has no specific laws involving androids and where they will be safe. And then there's Marcus. The caretaker android Marcus and his elderly owner return home and alert the police of a suspected burglary. In confronting the perpetrator, Marcus bypasses his programming, thereby becoming a deviant android with full autonomy and leading the police to shoot him at their arrival. Marcus awakes in a landfill of broken androids and after escaping, discovers Jericho, a wrecked ship and safe haven for deviants. There, Marcus rallies the others to fight for their civil rights. So, the big question's at play here. Can Marcus rally enough public support for the rights of androids? Will Kara make it safely to Canada with Alice? And can Connor find balance between his cyber life programming, his work relationship with Hank, and the call of deviancy to support the Jericho uprising? Most of all, can everyone make it through the story alive? So, Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Detroit Become Human? It sure is a video game that was made at one point. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff in it. I think it is very, very obvious that David Cage was not the head writer position on this game. Or the only writer, I guess I should say. Yeah, he, he started and then had another writer kind of fill in everything, yeah. Yeah, you can tell. Uh, I I think Connor's story is, like, actually really fun, just because those two characters work super well. Uh, Clancy Brown as Hank is so good. <laughs> he's amazing. He's, he's fantastic. Um, and it just gets better when you remember that that is Mr. Krabs. And uh, I think Marcus's story is definitely... A civil rights story written by a white person. (laughs) It is 100% that. I have mixed feelings about Kara, mainly because I think the twist at the end of her story is one of the stupidest twists I've ever experienced in a video game. Oh, it sucks. It's so bad. It's so stupid. It's so dumb. Uh, (laughs) I didn't play it, but... Back when the Super Best Friends were doing stuff, they had a whole brand around their grudge against David Cage uh, that started with Heavy Rain and, of course, eventually led to their legendary playthrough of Omicron, the Nomad Soul. But they did two full Let's Plays of Detroit Become Human. Um, They did one that was just the play the game run where they were trading off the controller where one of them was Marcus, one of them was Connor, one of them was Kara, uh, which got really fun when you had scenes of like characters chasing each other. Oh yeah. Fantastic. Uh, but the second one I believe was the, we're choosing violence run. (laughs) Hmm. So people wanted them to do a third. They did not do a third. Uh, I, I think that would have killed them. But both of those Let's Plays are possibly two of my favorite Let's Plays on the internet. And I highly, highly recommend them. 
because uh, they they ultimately I believe come out going like it's not a bad game, and I don't think it's a bad game. It's just there's a lot of cage on it, <laughs> and that's still kind of a problem. There is a lot of cage on it, and um, say what you will about David Cage, his games are always interesting. Not good, not bad. Interesting. I think Detroit Become Human from a technical overlook is quite the accomplishment for how it threads all of these stories and options all together. Uh, granted, does some of it start to fall apart a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, but overall, when you're trying to weave three characters, three character arcs uh, all together, it, it's pretty impressive what they can do uh, and all the options and all the endings. It's, it's, I think it's impressive in that regard. Is it too heavy handed in I have a dream civil rights fight <laughs> symbols and um, methodologies? Yeah, it's, it's not subtle at all. It's not even that clever. Um, there is an incredible part of that let's play where they're doing the part as Marcus where you're tagging the square after freeing all the ones that were in the shop. Yes. And they're joking about like, I have a dream and they go to bring it up. And it, that's one of the options. And uh, yeah. All three of them just start screaming. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, it could have been handled better. Uh, but I agree with you that Connor's arc is fascinating. I, I love it. The interaction with Hank, with Clancy Brown. So, so good. And it gets to some really interesting parts, depending on you know, which extreme uh, you get to play their relationship. So really good stuff there. Um, it, it's interesting to look into the game further. I learned a few things I didn't know about before. Oh, and before I do that, I should tell you what happened on my playthrough. Oh, yeah. What happened on my playthrough? Um, I, I played the Connor route pretty much perfectly, I think, which I'm I'm really happy with. Uh, you know, things went well with him and Hank and had that showdown in cyber life and totally had everything unlocked that I needed to to make that right. And it was great. And uh, yeah, you know, turned Deviant at the right point. It was, it was a great, so satisfying with Connor. Kara mostly played it fine, but at a certain point, um, you kind of lose agency on how her story turns out a bit because it's really all about the Marcus arc. And in that moment, in the big first big public demonstration moment where it had like, you know, that tagging and all that, uh, you know, the, the forces assemble, the police forces assemble. And I, I thought, you know, basically trying to be peaceful, essentially, and it turned him into a martyr. He died right there. And yeah, it kind of removes him from the story. And once he's no longer a tempering force on that rebellion, uh, the person left in charge ruins everything. So I think my Kara died like just shy of reaching Canada because <laughs> public sentiment wasn't good enough. Wow. Uh, so... That, that kind of part of the story for me turned into a mess, but Connor was perfect, and I love that part of the story, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's generally what what most people take away from it, is Connor's good, I've seen people flip-flop on Kara, and I don't know anybody that likes the Marcus <laughs> section, so. I think there are a couple neat Marcus moments, a couple, um the art at the beginning, the pulling yourself out of the rubble, but uh, it's, it's a lot of, you know, dramatic politics on how to handle a rebellion and it can get messy. Kara has some good sentimental moments, but then it's totally undercut by that bad twist at the ending. Yeah. And then I don't know if, you know, Luther was a nice force to bounce off of as far as like another main character for that. But then, you get to like this slot go mission and it's like, I, I didn't need that. So like it's, it's kind of a mixed bag there. Anyway, let's talk about the development of Detroit become human. How did this big technical work all come together? 
Well, it all starts with the 2012 PlayStation 3 tech demo, Kara, that Quantic Dream had pulled together. And it was this technical showpiece of graphics on the PS3. It's one of those moments that, you know, there have been several throughout the years where it's just like, wow, this is where we are with games and visual storytelling. Kara was a moment, um, especially, you know, the the acting and the the genuine motion capture there. It was just it was so good, and it received strong actions online. It won an award at the LA Shorts Fest. I feel like the most recent one of those moments was that uh, Matrix Unreal 5 demo. Just to see that, like, all in-engine live operating. I, it's another one of, like, this is where we are today, I guess. But for 2012, Kara was it. And so it starred Valerie Curry, who would end up reprising the title role in this game because writer and director David Cage wanted to make the demo into a full game, despite not originally having planned to, because he was curious as to what would happen next. So he took inspiration from Ray Kurzweil's 2005 nonfiction book, The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology, uh, trying to do a near-future prediction of what could happen with AI and androids and all that. So experts in artificial intelligence were consulted to discern which technological advancements were actually the most feasible, didn't want them to seem too far-fetched for a somewhat near future, and Detroit was chosen as the setting to revitalize a city that had succumbed to economic decline after a historical contribution to American industry with auto manufacturing. Uh, I feel like I should also mention part of my experience with Detroit Become Human, important that I live in the metro Detroit area. And so when a game is called Detroit, yeah, I'm probably going to play it, even if it's a David Cage game. (laughs) One day a game will take place in Kansas City. One day. Pre-production on Detroit Become Human started in late 2013. With an initial script between two and 3,000 pages. And the team even created a new game engine for the project, which was codenamed Horizon. Interesting. The development budget was 30 million euro. There was also a fourth character that was supposedly in the works, named Tracy. Uh, she had blonde hair. She had the face of the character that would become Chloe. Uh, Chloe being the character in the game that was the first android to pass the Turing test. And Tracy's origin story was similar to the other characters named Tracy in the final game. Uh, This protagonist's character details would end up being folded into a previously planned love interest for Marcus named Riley. And so this mishmash of a character and a few different aspects there became the character, the final character known as North. So the game would first be revealed in August, 2015 during a Sony press conference at Paris games week with follow-up appearances at E3 2016 and E3 2017, the latter of which announced a 2018 release window. Casting calls were extended to Los Angeles, London, and Paris for more than 250 actors to play 513 roles. The actors were then scanned in 3D, and then their models were made into characters. Shooting and animation followed, and in September 2017, the performance capture was finished after 324 days of shooting. The director of photography, Aymeric Montouche, notes how they used different visual representations for the three main characters. So... Kara got a thick grain and shaky long lens with a shallow depth of field. Connor got a small tight grain and a blue palette. And Marcus got orange and white colors in his palette. In addition to Valerie Curry returning as Kara, the characters of Connor and Marcus are played by Brian Deckert and Jesse Williams, respectively. Jesse Williams, who I did not recognize before playing this game, and then I'm like, oh, He's in Grey's Anatomy. Weird to see him uh, after experiencing Marcus, I'll just say that. Of course, there's Clancy Brown, 
Lance Henriksen and Minka Kelly, that they portray the supporting characters of Hank, Carl Manfred, and North, respectively. The game has 35,000 camera shots, 74,000 unique animations, and 5.1 million lines of code. Some beefy numbers for you there. The game reviewed favorably well, with a Metacritic average of 78 on PS4 and 80 on PC. Critics praised the setting, the visuals, the story, the main characters, their voice actors, the impact that choices had on the narrative, and the flowchart feature. But they criticized the motion controls because it's a PS4 game, you can do motion controls and also use that touchpad for some of the QTEs. There was also that mishandling of historical and thematic allegories, <laughs> and also aspects of the plot and characters. By October 2019, worldwide sales had reached 3.2 million copies on PlayStation 4, but it is now Quantic Dream's best-selling game, with 6 million copies sold across all versions of the game as of July 2021. The game was nominated for Audio Achievement and Artistic Achievement at the BAFTAs, but didn't win. It was nominated for four awards at the DICE Awards, including Outstanding Achievement in Original Music Composition, but didn't win any of those. And it was nominated for five Fan Favorite Awards at the Game Awards, with three of those being for Actor Performance, but again, didn't win any. 2018, a pretty tough year with you know God of War and Celeste and other amazing games. Red Dead Redemption 2, like, it was a tough year, that 2018 there. But it did win Best Original Instrumental at the Gang Awards, the Game Audio Network Guild. What's the legacy of Detroit Become Human? Uh, you know, some Let's Plays aside. Well, Brian Deckert got a Twitch following of almost half a million people because of his performance as Connor as he streams games along with his wife. But honestly, Quantic Dream is no longer with PlayStation as they got a minority investment from NetEase to become a self-publishing studio. And while they're not evading hostile workplace reports and countering with libel lawsuits, they are supposedly working on Star Wars Eclipse, which was revealed at 2021's Game Awards with a release window to be announced. The neat thing about the music in Detroit Become Human is each of the three characters have three different composers, one of whom we've talked about on the show before, but it's time to cover Philip Shepard. And Philip Shepard was born on November 4th, 1969. I'm going to guess in England, but it didn't specify as such. It just says he's an English composer. Oh, but he's more than that. He's a, quote, composer, producer, virtuoso cellist, inventor, public speaker, philanthropist, fellow of the Royal Academy of Music, and a creative innovator who has worked with some of the biggest names in music, tech, sport, and film. So, Shepard trained in cello and composition at the Royal Academy of Music, during which time he specialized in contemporary music. After completing a fellowship, he was made a professor at the Royal Academy of Music, where he is now a senior lecturer. Uh, that is a big, big, big deal uh, to be able to do that. After collaborating with other musicians as a cellist for years, Shepard's first orchestral soundtrack was commissioned in 2007 for the documentary feature In the Shadow of the Moon, which won awards at film festivals. He also notably recorded all of the arrangements for the world's 205 national anthems for the 2012 Olympic Summer Games in London. And he is also the CEO of LifeScore, which is a, quote, an endlessly adaptive music platform that creates unique real-time soundtracks. Basically, it uses AI after you compose and record the musical foundations, and it's based out of the legendary Abbey Road Studios. In March 2015, Shepard released the game Compose Yourself through ThinkFun, and it's a game that enables players to build their own symphonic works using a computer algorithm and a deck of cards. My brain has been destroyed 
every time I hear Compose Yourself, I just think of Cogsworth shouting, Please, Master, please, compose yourself. It's all I can hear. I wonder if there is some inspiration there. Hmm. Well, Philip Shepard was inducted into the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences as a member of the music class of 2017. So he votes for the Oscars. And you can follow him on Twitter at Philip Shepard. Uh, that's P H I L I P S H E P P A R D. Looking at his discography, there's a lot there, but nothing really that I recognize. And so that's kind of overwhelming. And then I look at what games he's worked on and, oh, it's, it's really just Detroit become human. Interesting. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye on what he's up to. But I mean, honestly, working out of Abbey Road Studios and being a member of the Royal Academy of Music, that's, that's pretty substantial. As I mentioned, there are three different composers for Detroit Become Human, one for each playable character. So Philip Shepard composes the music for Kara, Nima Fakrara composes the music for Connor, and John Paisano composes for Marcus. Also, Adam Hochstatter and Braden Kimball also worked with John Paisano, and they composed additional music for Marcus. Now, we'll discuss their approaches more in depth shortly when we talk about the critical tracks and kind of bring in the music side by side along with it. But of course, they all recorded in different places. Uh, Nima Fakrara, he recorded at Zoo Creatives in Marina del Rey, California. Philip Shepard recorded at Abbey Road Studios with the English Session Orchestra. And John Paisano was with the Berlin Orchestra at Synchron Stage Vienna with the Synchron Stage Orchestra as well. A fourth disc on the digital deluxe edition of the soundtrack, which like is like over a hundred tracks of music. It's it's full and verbose and all of that. But a fourth disc includes Detroit's artists, and it includes some of the diegetic music in the game, like what's playing on radios. Oh, what does H- Hank have on the radio in his home? Or radios in the car when Kara and Alice are trying to shiver in the cold with the limited. Uh, sort of housing that they have with a car. And these include performances by Emily Rose, The Whiskey Charmers, Thornetta Davis, The Brightmoors, Model 500, Rocket 455, and White Shag. So what does this soundtrack actually sound like with its three composers for three protagonists here for Detroit Become Human? Let's get to the five critical tracks. And we start with this first one, Connor Main Theme. I think if I had to pick amongst the three different sounds for the three different characters, not only is Connor my favorite narratively and what his gameplay is like as a a detective investigating crime scenes, piecing everything together, I I love that, but also just love his music. Uh, This approach composed by Nima Fakrara, just is so cool sounding and just this it's like really the light motif that kind of represents Connor here and Fakrara used custom instruments and also vintage synthesizers in order to replicate this sound that would represent the robotic nature of Connor uh, you see in this behind the music feature right? it's got like these big strings that he's like manipulating and then records it and works with it digitally and also these old Moog synthesizers just a whole lot of stuff at play because Connor is an android and sticks to that programming the most rigidly or at least has the opportunity to uh, being you know cyber life's golden boy essentially you know, has meetings with like this big figure for cyber life, almost like, um, 
I kind of relate her to like the Amanda Waller sort of character for Suicide Squad. Like you have to kind of go back and answer to your boss essentially, right? Uh, so, you know, big dilemmas here, but at his core, like tries to, you know, live by that programming. And so this boom, 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 like this kind of undercurrent running through it. But at the same time, uh, the hits in his main theme here with the, the big epic orchestra, like big things are happening and you get to make some big choices. Uh, I really, really love this theme. I uh, almost put the hostage track here because uh, this, this first tutorial level, with, uh, you know, investigating the apartment that's on top of the Renaissance building in Detroit because you're going up, you know, that that tall levels. At least that's the interpretation I have of it. But it was kind of what was used as the demo to describe Detroit Become Human. Really works with these, you know, melodies and this leitmotif early on. So as much as I would like that piece a lot and, you know, kind of establishing the foundation for the gameplay that you're learning, it's all worked into Connor because this is... Connor, and he is the android from Cyberlife. The synth parts kind of remind me of Portal 2. Sure. Like, that's, for some reason, that is all I can hear when I listen to, especially in the clip. You can hear at the start of the clip that it feels like something that would play in, in Portal 2. But, yeah, I think you basically hit the nail on the head. Of the three themes... I don't remember a lot about Marcus or Kara's themes, but I do remember this one. And uh, yeah, it's it's very good. It is by far the standout. I, I agree. I, there are some people who would pull for Kara's more, I think, and we'll, we'll get to that shortly. I would agree that Marcus's main theme is the weakest, uh, but this one, it's so similar to the first gameplay that you hear, and it definitely sticks with you. Number two on the Critical Five, let's get to some Connor action. And this track is called Now. So while a lot of Connor's gameplay early on is very slow paced, investigate the crime scene, try to piece things together. After you start to investigate an apartment building and realize that there's an android that's been living there, suddenly you discover that android. And uh, since you're a police detective, you got to chase him down. This android that is experiencing rampancy and discovering RA9. Uh, he's on the run, and so you got to chase Rupert. And so this piece, composed by Nima Fakrara, definitely represents this exciting action. Like the first big exciting action set piece that you get to do as Connor. And it's really neat how like he uses the Connor leitmotif, but just really amped up and exciting. You get to this part with the falling strings. Get some electronic modulation in there. Uh, because since you're also chasing along with Hank... You have to kind of balance that relationship and not, you know, overtake him too much with your Android skills. So kind of, again, the tensions at play there, you really feel that there. I love those heavy brass chords that come in at the end of the clip. It definitely seems like a fan favorite for like an action piece, especially for their favorite Android boy. Uh, so this is one that I felt was fitting to go on the Critical Five. I think this is my favorite on the Critical Five, uh, pretty much just because I really like the strings in this song, just in general. I like their energy, I like everything about them, honestly. And yeah, I think that alone makes this pretty much the one I like best on the Critical Five in general. The intense pace and the string work only continues in our final Connor theme on the Critical Five. Number three here from Detroit Become Human. This is They All Look the Same.
Once again, since it is a Connor piece, it is composed by Nima Fakrara. And this plays when Connor is fighting Tracy models, especially the blue-haired Tracy, who are androids that are made for intimacy, and they are in storage at the Eden Club. According to the official concept art for the game, all of the Tracy models were originally planned to be identical women with blonde hair. And that actually explains the title for this piece, of They All Look the Same. Even though that in the final game, Connor ends up encountering the blue-haired Tracy. So remember how I said how Brian Deckard streams games with his wife uh, on Twitch and all that? They have quite a big audience. Well, she is the actor who plays the blue-haired Tracy. And so they got married about a month after the game released. So it suggests that they met during the filming of this fight sequence. And if that's not adorable, I don't know what is. It's equal parts adorable and weird. <laughs> oh, how did you guys meet? Uh, we were playing a scene where she played a robot stripper and I had to beat her up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, okay then. Musically, though, uh, this makes perfect sense when it's like all this dark chaos in a back storage room and it's a brawl for survival. Uh, you have like these deep piano notes throughout the piece that are echoing the Connor theme of doom, 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 and this starts to get more and more distorted. Uh, at the end of the clip, though, you get these frenetic string notes, and I would almost guess that represents like Tracy's panic here because you're trying to find these lovers who are supposedly experiencing deviancy and uh, what happens then do you let them go do you bring them in questions that connor has to answer but yeah i feel like this is one of the more amplified action pieces for connor it really caught my ear and i just thought it was interesting that it kind of ties in the story of like yeah the actors for connor and tracy are now married anyways in, in terms of music uh i do remember this moment pretty clearly uh, mostly because I think it has one of my favorite exchanges of Connor saying, I need you to rent this one. And Hank, Hank realizing he's going to have to write a reimbursement form <laughs> <laughs> uh, for this, of all things. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. This song, this song fits that specific uh, sequence very well. Let's get to another character besides Connor, though, here on the Critical Five for Detroit Become Human. And so this would be Kara main theme. Another very strong leitmotif in the game comes from Kara's main theme, and it is composed by Philip Shepard. It is the track that was the winner of Best Original Instrumental at the Game Audio Network Guild Awards, and Shepard really draws on his cello performance experience here because cello is a primary instrument in Kara's pieces here, and for her theme in particular, uh, Philip Shepard said that it was inspired by watching flames of a log fire. And so it would kind of set this cello foundation of like kind of rocking back and forth between a couple strings. And then this kind of simple melody that just came to him with da 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 da. And then just kind of goes from there and blends it all together. He says a lot of Kara's pieces have at least one, if not both of those elements kind of infused in them. So it's, it's a really strong leitmotif to represent her character. And especially when Alice gets involved in the picture, it becomes a little more like, I think music boxy to represent like the childlike innocence there. Uh, just really, really good stuff here. Joe, we've talked in the past before about 
you know, playing music in like high school orchestras and things like that. If that's something that is appealing to you, the sheet music for this piece is available on Philip Shepard's website at philipshepard.com. Hey, more game soundtracks should do that. Please, please. I like the song. Again, I think Connor's theme is the standout still. But uh, this is good. I don't know, something about the violins, especially in the clip, like, it's a little too shrill at certain points. Uh, not to, like, a terrible degree, but it, it bothers me slightly. But overall, I do really like the leitmotif. I think uh, now that I am hearing it again, I think it might be the leitmotif I remember the most from my not playing the game. Yeah, let's go with that one. <laughs> it's definitely a strong one, uh, that is for sure. But how do we represent Marcus in the Critical Five? Well, we kind of mentioned how uh, not really big fans of his main theme piece, but why not pick a climactic moment for Marcus? And that would be number five here on the Critical Tracks for Detroit Become Human. This is We Are People. Epic hero moment for Marcus, as this is the big public protest where the androids are demanding that they are people, they deserve rights. Of course, Marcus's music composed by John Paisano, uh, who he did cover previously for his work on Marvel's Spider-Man. And you can definitely hear some of those similarities between uh, the two games, the two soundtracks here, just having that epic kind of feeling Paisano's approach to composing for Marcus, though, because uh, his his main theme for Marcus is simpler and more piano-based with some slight choral elements coming in. Again, it's, it's nice, but I don't think it stands out compared to the other two characters. But the approach was that Marcus should have music that is, quote, like a church hymn, because it would personify Marcus's transformation into a leader. Uh, a almost religious-like figure for his movement. Uh, John Paisano said, though, that he didn't want to make it too recognizable as Bach-like. Uh, you can't make it, you know, too classical and all that with, you know, some of Bach's classic pieces. But I definitely wanted to represent the almost deification of Marcus as a religious-like leader for his movement. I could see why that would be the approach, given what Marcus's story is. That's still really uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I 100% agree. You can you can definitely hear like the similarities between this and Spider Man. Uh, it's it's very very clear, and it's really interesting when you can tell that there. Like we talk about a lot of composers where you can sort of tell that sometimes, but then you get stuff like this or like anything Yoko Shimamura touches, where it's like, oh yeah. You can tell it's them and guess it pretty quick. Uh, so I think if I knew that John Paisano was on this soundtrack before this, absolutely, I probably would have been able to guess this was him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's definitely Marcus's route. Unless you have him die here like I did. I'm pretty sure the best friends in their first playthrough also had him die right there <laughs> right uh, hmm. okay i don't feel too bad now okay a couple tracks on the cutting room floor for me i have two the first one here is run with me This piece is composed by Philip Shepard because it is a Kara piece. Uh, you as Kara and Alice 
are running away from Connor. Connor is chasing you throughout the Detroit streets, and it's, a, I think, a brilliant sequence where the quick time events are just going back and forth between the two, and how do you play it? And you can hear the blending of the two characters also in this piece. I think it's so neat how you kind of hear the backbone of the Connor leitmotif, even that doom 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 kind of falling action there. Uh, but it's, you know, that kind of low synth going on there. And then on top, the main action as the main chapter is driving it is Kara and the cello and really that kind of orchestral string swell there. I think it's just so cool. A lot of fans note this as one of their favorites. And it's it's a memorable moment where, again, yeah, it's always great when you have these characters that you're playing separately. But when they collide, how does that interact? And this is the first moment of that in the game. Do you think they had to like flip a coin to see who got to make this one since it's two characters? <laughs> well, you wonder, but I think, you know, the main thought is like it's a Kara chapter. That's fair. So, you know, they got to, you know, pass on, hey, hey, Philip, this is kind of your domain. Oh, maybe you have to consult with uh, Nima Fakhrara there a little bit. You know, how, how does this character's music go? Okay, we'll, we'll mix it in in this way. I would imagine there's some collaboration there. The other one on the cutting room floor for me is a Marcus piece. It's something you've never seen before. This is composed by John Paisano, and it's a nice, sweet, emotional moment because this plays at the beginning of Marcus's story, where Carl Manfred, his uh, elderly person that he's looking after and a famous artist, is uh, just, hey, Marcus, you know, why don't why don't you paint something in this Lance Hendrickson baritone that is just amazing? But here, pick what you want to paint, Marcus, and... I feel like this is where it's a more aesthetically pleasing version of his main theme and his leitmotif. You have this alternating high piano notes that's kind of used from the Marcus theme, but then it's just explored with this full grandeur with the orchestra. And Marcus is creating something beautiful and all Lance Hendrickson, all Carl can look back is just be like, wow, this is, a really dramatic piece for that scene though he's just painting <laughs> i mean i get the i get the idea that like he's he's an android showing creativity but like he's just he's just painting i suppose that comes with the the heavy-handed nature of the david cage writing of, <laughs> this is the start of his journey he is special he's born for more than this was he born was he he's created but he was meant for more <laughs> yeah yeah and it's a good it's a good piece it's just i would never have thought this was during that scene what will i never forget about Detroit become human. Oh, I was so salty at North when I finished playing the first time. I think I stumbled across an old Facebook post I made of it pretty recently too, where it's just like, this character ruined everything in my run. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, kind of salty at North, but honestly, it's, it's the Connor stuff that stands out. And uh, looking back on it and trying to remember elements of the game and how I played it. Just so much good stuff there. Uh, man, that that showdown in Cyberlife with the doppelganger and does Hank trust you? And ah, uh, uh, so good. One of the better moments of the game, I think. Uh, North sucks just as a character in general. Um, she's so bitter and just prone to violence. And so if she's left unattended, uh, she will be like a firecracker and just cause untold damage. And also, if you end up on the romance path with her, uh, it comes out of nowhere and doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Maybe because she was just a collection and collaboration of other characters along the way. <laughs> Probably. Uh, the thing that I'll never forget, and I 
actually did forget it, so this is a lie, but pretend I'm not lying. Um, halfway through this episode, I remembered that there's an android on the main menu. Yeah. And at the, at the end of the game, she asks you to free her, and you can do that. And then gamers were like, but I want her back, though. So they... <laughs> They patched the game so that you could bring her back if you wanted, which, guys, <laughs> way to miss the point, 100%. I, this game's so heavy-handed, how did you possibly miss the point? I don't understand. <laughs> Chloe is an interesting element to that main menu, but I wouldn't be begging for her to be back after you made... Okay. Also, uh, big parallels between, like, Elijah Kamsky and, uh, shall we say, other tech entrepreneurs these days. Yeah. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Certain people who aren't buying Twitter anymore. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know how we can really compare well we can do a lot of contrasting between calico and detroit become human but you know what these 2020 steam games at least they're fun to talk about i'm pretty happy with this episode i'm glad we got to cover these games as vast and different as they are so that will do it for us this week on original sound chat you can find me on twitter at pete speakeasy joe is over at string pixel the video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want. That's hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. It's where Joe's other podcast, Smasher Pieces, is hosted. And you can find Smasher Pieces and Original Sound Chat wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even on Spotify. We have a feed of podcast episodes for you to subscribe to, but we also have a Spotify playlist. And if we cover a video game music track on this show and it's on Spotify, it's getting added to that monster playlist. Joe, what's being added this week? Both of these soundtracks are on Spotify, so both. We love it when that happens. Also, I don't know if we've been adding the VGM Hurdle tracks. Probably not. But also, DuckTales The Moon is on there, right? right. It is, but it's already on the, it's already on the playlist, yeah. Exactly. So even if we were adding... The VGM Hurdle Tracks? Well, don't worry. This week's already on there when we talked about DuckTales before. Joe, who are we talking about next week? I will be talking about Kimitaka Matsumai. And I'll be talking about Solar Fields. All right, to play us out, I think we can both agree that our favorite track from Detroit Become Human is Connor's theme. And so... To find a fan cover, a fan remix of Connor's theme, there's one that has a surprisingly high number of views from Rob Landis, L-A-N-D-E-S, on YouTube. And so his cello work takes the musical framework of the Connor theme, but uses that cello from Kara's theme. And so he calls it, fittingly, Connor meets Kara's theme. It's really neat. And I definitely enjoyed listening to it. I hope you do too. Thanks so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>